the sanction system allows Iraq to sell oil for food, for medicine, for other humanitarian supplies for the Iraqi people. We have no quarrel with them. But without the sanctions, we would see the oil for food program become oil for tanks. The only way into sanctions bound Baghdad is to drive a thousand kilometers across the desert from Jordan. And here, for anyone to see, is the absurdity of sanctions. An endless procession of oil tankers heading out, container trucks coming back in. Some are on legitimate business, part of the oil for food program. But most are in the business of sanctions busting. United Nations sanctions inspectors check only one truck in 20 at the Jordanian frontier. On the northern border with Turkey, it's one in 200. All of this under the benevolent eye of the United Nations Security Council. We know it. We know that the, bo the borders are porous. We know that uh, our goods are entering the country over which we have no control. We don't know the content of the uh, consignments that come in. So this is an, a really, um, the, I can use no other word, it's, it's, it's hypocrisy. Saddam Hussein openly defies the UN economic blockade. This year he will smuggle an estimated one billion dollars worth of oil out of Iraq. A billion dollars he'll spend keeping his regime well fed, well equipped and most importantly loyal. The regime is in power. There has been hardly any cabinet change over the years. It's the same team, year after year, that stays firmly in the saddle. And 23 million people have fallen off that saddle. Hans von Sponick is the United Nations humanitarian coordinator running the Oil for Food program. But the top UN official in Baghdad is now quitting his job, a bitter and angry man. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye-bye. Okay, bye -bye. Bye. If uh, mortality trends for children under five of the 80s had continued into the 90s, then uh, there would be 500,000 children still alive. I think that's a very powerful uh, piece of evidence to show that uh, sanctions have really uh, damaged enormously uh, a, a population. The West's ultimatum to Saddam is clear. Give up your missiles and chemicals, the so-called weapons of mass destruction, and sanctions will be lifted. Saddam refuses to comply the US and Britain won't let the UN back down, and an estimated half a million young children have died from a lack of food and medicine. If sanctions are not lifted, I would say the international community becomes more and more liable to be um, a co-accused uh, in, 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 in something that is no longer defendable. Nearly a decade of sanctions have reduced Iraq's first world health infrastructure to a third world shambles. Doctors are forced to watch increasing numbers of children die from chest infections and other simple treatable illnesses. We used to have uh, two to three deaths per week or per ten days in the hospital prior to the embargo time. This figure is now two to three deaths every day in the hospital. This is a huge number. And every now and then you will see, you can hear some families that are crying that have lost their uh, children. In theory, medicine is exempt from the blockade. But the UN Sanctions Review Committee often deems medical supplies to be dual use, meaning they could be of benefit to Iraq's military. At various times, syringes, even bed linen has been banned. 
They are delicate babies. They need special care. There's still no chlorine for the heavily polluted water supply. Chlorine could be used in chemical weapons. And no spares for technical equipment, including incubators, as the parts could be cannibalized for weapons research. The central oxygen sometimes in the hospital will be cut and will not be present because it needs to be brought from a certain factory and sometimes it is not functioning the factory and they will not supply us with oxygen. This will be a catastrophe so that at that, that night, uh, I remember a night when the oxygen has been cut and eight neonates have died in the same night because of the lack of oxygen in this ward. That was a very horrible night at that time. It had occurred, uh, I think, one month ago in last March. $1.7 billion worth of goods paid for under the Oil for Food program are still on hold, awaiting approval by the sanctions committee. The UN recently promised to streamline the review process for medicine. But even if adequate medical supplies could get in, the civil distribution system has collapsed. Leukaemia patients like Ali are beyond help. Can you do anything for his pain? No, actually. Even the sedatives, including morphine and others, these things are lacking and we can't afford giving them to our patients. This is one of the medications that we are lacking too, so that if the child is in agony and in pain and he's even dying, we can't give him anything that can sedate him because we don't have it simply. We are not animals, so that you can, uh, you can have these sanctions and this embargo, kill the Iraqi population, destroy them. Why all these things? A desperate woman interrupts the doctor, insisting that we follow her. He's very, very dangerous. Maybe he is dying. Uh, in he, uh, the fever. I can't. In Iraq, this is a dangerous move. Such unapproved contact with foreigners can draw suspicion and arrest. She's a baby. She's a mother. I am auntie. Yes. Hello. Auntie for Omar. Her name is Lena, 40 years old, never married. She lives for her eight-year-old nephew, Omar, another leukemia patient. He's uh, n not bleeding now, but uh, he's uh, fever. Uh, fever. She's fever. Having high grade fever. Uh, and where did you get the drugs from? For, from uh, any patient. She has borrowed it from another patient, any actually, patient. hoping that she will uh, return it back to them. You, you bought that from them? Uh, you yeah. pay money? Yeah. So these drugs have to be smuggled in and yes. sold, uh, I guess, almost on a medical black market. That's, that's what happens. Yes, yes, Some, something like that. He needs oh, decent nice. reliable antibiotics, and these are not available all the time, and the family were obliged to bring certain medication from outside the hospital. Is that going to be enough? Um, well, I don't think so, actually. It is not only the quantity of the drug that is lacking, but also the efficacy of the drug. Many of these medications are coming from non-reliable origins. The Simpiclox is from Malaysia, and the Clafon is from Turkey. Omar's family has spent every cent they've got on ineffective black market medicine. Look at the picture. It's nice. Well, no, he's... Maybe he's... Uh, what can I do for him? If anything, I can buy to give... to help Omar. Lena insists on taking us home to meet the rest of the family. Five brothers, their wives and children, now forced to live under the one roof. His father, Omar's father, Ali, too distraught to visit his son in hospital, greets us at the gate. They were part of Iraq's large middle class, well-educated, well-paid, well-travelled. Now they're destitute. Ali survives on a near worthless government pension. Lena still has a clerical job, a salary now worth only $1.50 a month. Not nearly enough for Omar's medication. You're going to sell all the, the lounge yeah, yeah, yeah. and chairs because and tables? Because they give money, uh, good money yeah. when you buy it. How much do you think you'd get for all of this? Maybe 300 300000 uh, 300000 dinar. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. All. For everything, the dining with room the table, carpet. with the carpet, and the carpets. Uh -huh. So there'll be nothing left in this room. Oh, oh okay. Uh, that's uh, life, Omar. 
Just Our unannounced visit attracts friends and neighbours, including Riyadh, a British-trained engineer. They used to live a reasonable life. They could spend, they could change their car every three years or two years. They could go on holidays outside of Iraq. Now they're taking that three dollars a month or two dollars a month U.S. dollars. What can they buy? Uh, uh, a one pound, a one kilogram of meat costs uh, one dollar. Lena says sanctions claimed the life of her mother, who died in this very room because there was no medicine to treat her after a stroke. She was dying with my hand in here. She, I, because I, I can't uh, help her because I don't have any money and how can I help her? And she's died. She died. And then Omar, his disease, you know, what can I do? He's a symbol for us in this district. He's a symbol. He's our son. He's not just uh, Ahmed's nephew or his father's son. He's our son. This can happen to any of our children. But not everyone is doing it tough in Saddam Hussein's Iraq. Under the glow of a nearby oil refinery, Baghdad's nouveau riche come out to play. Saddam's favoured cronies who take their cut from his lucrative smuggling operations. A meal here would cost an ordinary Iraqi a year's pay. Little wonder that this elite community are contemptuously referred to as the war rats. Their richness is beyond imagining anything like that. They're, they're under uh, a reasonable political and economical cover. You know, they're, uh, they're well established, but they, they, we have, we, we, we're the ones who need help. Before the Gulf War, Iraq imported 70% of its food. After the economic blockade was imposed, it took five long years of sanctions-induced near starvation before Saddam finally agreed to the UN Oil for Food program. There are now 49,000 of these ration points across the country. UN aid workers say it's a good idea that simply doesn't go far enough. A drip feed that can't save everyone. In uh, terms of actual figures, it, we estimate that at least of half a million children under five have died who ordinarily would not have died if the decline in mortality that was prevalent in the 80s has continued right through the 90s. So basically we're talking about half a million excess deaths at least amongst children under five. Clearly uh, these are half a million children whose uh, right to survival was not protected. So it's just unacceptable, that's all I can say. Down in Saddam City, Baghdad's grandly named slum, one and a half million people eke out a miserable existence. Here, the collapse of infrastructure has been total. No, don't say this. Miss? Hello, Jasm. How are you? Thank you. And you? Iraq once boasted an education system, second to none in the region with free tuition to university level. Look at this. Um, These days, persisting with schooling can be fatal. You see, this is where, these, these are the set of toilet and... Uh, sanitation. Yeah. Can you just see this? A total clogging of the sewerage system. No facilities for children. No water, drinking water. Cholera has re-emerged as a problem. Last summer there was a major public health uh, crisis in terms of cholera. Polio has re-emerged in the country. Last year there were 72 cases, confirmed cases of polio. Ordinary Iraqis also face the prospect of a very sudden death. 
US and British aircraft have been enforcing the blockade, patrolling Iraq's skies since the end of the Gulf War. But for the past 18 months, they've been challenged by Saddam's anti-aircraft defences. Clashes occur almost daily, often with tragic results. This was the aftermath of the first case of what Americans would call collateral damage. In January last year, a misguided US missile hit a suburb in the southern city of Basra, killing six, wounding 60. The UN says 144 Iraqi civilians died in such attacks last year, with another 450 injured. <laughs> Today, it's not hard to find survivors of the Basra bombing. What is her name? Fatma. It's Fatma. Fatma Jassim. Away from the crowd, a young boy named Ali guides us through the streets, past the broken sewers and filth, to where his family was relocated after the attack. This is, this is your mother? Three of his sisters died when their house took a direct hit from a US bomb. Ali's mother can barely bring herself to talk about it. This is the two-and-a-half-year-old. This is another picture of the older one. And the other one, we, they didn't have any pictures of her yet, the baby. But for this family, there is one glimmer of hope. What is her name? Zainab. Zainab, named after her sister. Zina will join Iraq's sanctions generation, born or raised, into a life of suffering and pain. Many young Iraqis blame the West, not Saddam, who is increasingly viewed as a moderate, not tough enough, on Iraq's tormentors. If sanctions are not lifted, every day that passes enhances the uh, chances that we are creating an anti-Western uh, group of people there who are tomorrow's political leaders, tomorrow's decision makers. Is that what we want? In a way, uh, Iraq has become uh, a, a sanction testing laboratory. That's how I see it. Okay. Bye bye. Hans von Sponick is just the latest in a line of senior UN officials to quit over the organization's inability to fix this humanitarian disaster. What advice would you give to the new coordinator who's coming to direct a program you yourself have said is not working? Honesty. Be honest. Learn quickly and then have the courage to advise the Secretary General very, very straightforwardly. Out of tears come to smile. His message was simple. Maintain a military embargo, but end economic sanctions. It's a plea that's fallen on deaf ears. Omar has also departed. He died a week after we first encountered Lena at the hospital. Born just after the Gulf War, his life ends just weeks short of his ninth birthday. Truly a child of the sanctions generation. Sent to his grave by the West's apparent willingness to be manipulated by Saddam Hussein. By chance, we finally discover why the authorities were so nervous by our filming this family. Omar's father is a retired intelligence officer, abandoned in his hour of need by a regime he once staunchly defended. <laughs> Those with a sense of retribution may see the sins of the father visited upon the son. 
In Iraq, the sins of a dictator have been inflicted upon an entire nation.